Hi, everyone. So good to see you again. And thank you so much for making time uh, to invest in the future of STEM, but also in your own professional development. So today we're at the second session of the Equity and Action Professional Development Series. And as I mentioned last month, our goal throughout these sessions is to support you with research and practices that are informed by the Aspire Alliance's inclusive faculty framework. Um, and we know that through this framework and everything you learn, you will be a partner uh, with one another, but also this community in creating a more diverse and inclusive STEM. For the next several months, there will be additional sessions beginning in January uh, that will focus on inclusive teaching, inclusive advising, inclusive mentoring, and finally in April, inclusive leadership and the colleagueship. So joining me today, um, our Q&A moderator is Dr. Nancy Campos. Nancy, maybe give a wave. Um, Nancy is director of SUNY New Paltz, um, the AC2 program, which combines the Collegiate Science and Technology Entry Program and the Lewis Stokes Alliance for Minority Participation. She's also an Aspire Alliance Summer Institute graduate. So last month um, when we started the session, I mentioned uh, the loss of a dean uh, in New York, someone who was incredibly qualified and experienced, who decided uh, she was gonna leave her dean position because there was just such a lack of support, but also a lack of acknowledgement of the difficulties of being black in these spaces, especially within leadership. And so as I started to think about Dr. McGee's work and her presentation today, you know, I recall that over the last month, I've actually come across a number of senior colleagues, people of color, many of whom are tenured, who not only stepped away from their roles, but they stepped away from the academy. And so they've accepted new positions um, in industry, uh, in pharma pharmaceutical companies, uh, in um, more practitioner-based um, career paths. And so I have to wonder, when we talk about Black turnover in our institutions, um, what voice do we bring to it? Um, I think it's really easy to focus on the individual and things that we feel they may not have done well enough, have not done enough of, or uh, perhaps they're resistant to fitting in those organizations. But if I think back to my own career journey and discussions that I've had with colleagues um, at my prior institution, as well as at my current one, oftentimes the conversation also focuses on benign neglect. Um, being kind of left out on one's own uh, to figure it out without participating and being valued in a culture that wants to see you succeed and provide everything necessary for that to happen. And so that brings me to today's session, which uh, will be presented by Dr. Ebony McGee, who's at Vanderbilt University. And we're going to be focused on her new book, Black, Brown, and Bruised, How Racialized STEM Stifles Innovation. This work is a product of Dr. McGee's years of heavily funded research on the experiences of STEM students and professionals. And if you regularly read the Chronicle of Higher Ed, you may have noticed this week that she had an op-ed um, titled, Ready to be an Ally for Black Academics. Here's a start, 12 ways that white faculty members can better support black academics in their department and across campus. Thank you so much, Ebony, for your work and your time today. I will turn it over to you. Wow, best intro ever. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. I really appreciate that and just appreciate your mentorship you know, over the years, because we met actually as I was an assistant professor, and you've always been so gracious with your time, with your energy. Pet to threat syndrome is something I still talk about. I just did it yesterday at Northwestern University. So 
Thank you so much. And thanks to Aspire just for being the first organization that said, without even reading the book, we believe in you. We are going to buy this book. So I am just so grateful. Um, continue to be grateful. Okay, let me not get emotional. Um, my Twitter is Relationship Gap. You know, if you see something that you like, please tweet it. If you see something that you don't like, email me. I'm, I'm open for uh, all kind of comments, feedback, and critique. So I'm not going to do a traditional agenda because my agenda is I'm a Black woman in this country and I'm hurting, and I'm sure many of you are also hurting for a variety of reasons. I'm going to read this poem from Dr. Joe Bulawemi. It is time to slay the lies that my life is lesser, that my skin is tougher, that my heart should suffer, that my mind is broken, that my kind is other, that I'm not your brother. The reason why this resonated so much with me and Dr. Thomas talked about the sister who, you know, was basically pushed out of her position is, you know, I really want to be in a discipline where I bring my full authentic self to STEM. And Dr. Bola Wimmy, this is exactly what she represents and it's exactly what STEM needs the ability to bring our full authentic selves into our discipline. So let me jump right in by saying, guess what y'all? Innovation is damn near dead. The economist Robert Jordan argued that almost everything that we view is new and novel, including the internet and the smartphone is simply a variation on these themes that you see on the screen. And the pace of innovation has radically slowed during the past half century. And he is far from alone in this critique. In spite of some significant financial investments in research and development, both within and beyond the academy and corporate America, since about the 1970s, there has been a drastically lowered innovation rate. Now, although this may be shocking to some of us on the line, this was actually really affirming to me because I always thought that we should be flying in our cars right now. And this provides me some evidence that I might have actually been correct. Well, when we look at the reasons, the explanations behind why this stagnation has occurred, we hear very cookie cutter responses that are displayed. Maybe it's just harder. We've, we've discovered everything, no, nothing else to discover, no motivation to discover anything new. And I was like, mm, okay, if you say so, but I still had questions regarding why is innovation practically dead? My questions had to do deal around the legacy of white supremacy, uh, the interrogation or lack thereof of anti-blackness in STEM, the kind of frame that normalizes white racial thought ideology superiority in STEM. And also the assertion that the knowledge production is neutral, it's subjective, it's rational, you know, it's just problem free and unconnected to power. So I knew those were things that these very prestigious scholars and economists were not taking into consideration when they're when they were thinking about the stagnation. So I knew I had to go back in time to really understand uh, the antecedents of STEM education in the United States. And people typically go back to Sputnik and, you know, Sputnik was a thing, not going to deny that. But I wanted to go a little bit further back than that to really understand not only the horrific conditions of slavery and the slave trade, but who built the ship? Who what, who engineered the design 
to endure 600 enslaved men, women, and children in prison horizontally for several months on end. Who did that? Who designed that? Who engineered that? And why did they engineer it for such dehumanization? When we think about the cotton industry in many industries in the US that were founded under slavery and genocide, we don't think about the enslaved people who not only did the labor, but were also directly involved in inventing the machinery and the technology that enrich in the pockets of white supremacists. And when we think about our indigenous brothers and sisters, and we think about white folks poisoning the water wells so the indigenous folks would, would die, who were, the, who were the chemists behind that? Who suggested that we were going to poison them and what stemmers were behind that genocide? So these are the things that we really need to grapple with if we want to understand why STEM is so, is bled in white supremacy. So for those of you who's like, well, you know, black folks always go back to slavery. I'm gonna tell you about some other things. When we think about highways, highways are a racist legacy. It is a physical form of segregation. And I know we are tearing down monuments to white supremacists, but we really need to think about tearing down some highways. Highways are more likely to bust through and bust up black neighborhoods, a lingering monument to this racist legacy. There are more car crashes, there's more asthma, there's even more lower cognitive function more police harassment, they are very similar to monuments. When we think about architecture in buildings, we need to think about who this architecture serves to bring in and who, how it is instructed to leave certain bodies out. And when we think about the military, did you know? Of course, it is one of the most violent forces of upholding white supremacy, but militarism is also the largest single cause of environmental destruction in the world. And the US military is the largest single pollutant in the planet and the largest single consumer of oil in the world. If that hasn't convinced you, I have more. Pedro Nogueira, Dr. Pedro Nogueira reminds us that there are no ghettos in Canada. There's no ghettos in many parts of the world. Ghettos were created and they were designed by stemmers. They were invented. And like all inventions that have been racialized, it has an outsized impact on our racial geographic geography. I'm gonna talk about universities in a minute, but even systems where we think we're designed to cater to black and brown bodies have different standards like the transit system where there's one standard for people who choose to ride and people who are dependent or forced to ride on transit. And the system is designed for white comfort and for black bodies being removed at certain sections of certain cities. So as a little girl in Chicago, my mom told me that the whole city was mine, not just the South side, not just the West side. And when we would ride to the North side on the bus, you see the marker where all the black people get off and all the white people get on. And I wondered as a little girl, well, this is my bus. I paid my fare. Why do I feel so uncomfortable now? And now I understand this is reproducing structural racism in transit. Technology has also been designed to maintain white supremacy. Do you know that a racist white supremacist 
and eugenicist named William Shockley created Silicon Valley. Again, the understanding of this history is so important to unpacking the evolution of racist technology that we see today in facial recognition, et cetera, et cetera. You know, even when we go to the doctors, the algorithms that are used to assist them sometimes penalize you just by virtue of having a black or brown body. That's it. And even our children are being exposed to racism and white supremacy through children's games and children's apps. We far know the story about testing, um, ACT, SAT, GRE, LSAT, all of them are biased and privileged white, often middle to upper middle class folks. But even things like DNA tests can amplify racist views. This is called racial essentialism, where people are now going out trying to prove how genetically white and pure, quote unquote, they are. And this is defining some folks' core essence about what percentage of white they are you know, mortgage loans, really any loan for that matter, credit scores and the like are also biased against black people and other folks of color. And even when we think about the science of marijuana, we can't even get in the weed game. Black people are four times more likely to be arrested for marijuana possession and being arrested eliminates you from being in the $77 billion marijuana business. So these, even these markets are purposely keeping people out who have prior conven con convic convictions, excuse me, with marijuana. So those are some, I went from historical to current, but I wanna give you one more historical flavor. Dr. Lisa Cook talked about the importance of understanding patents to understanding the heart of America's innovation um, policies. Black inventors were either born or forced into American slavery, have largely been ignored in the patent process. And she argues in her study that took her 10 years to publish in spite of having three very prominent folks in her field vouching for the work. It took 10 years to publish. She talks about three things that contribute to a loss of 1,100 patent ideas from the African-American community. Those three things are Plessy versus Ferguson, separate and hella unequal, right? Forget what they said in the mandate. It's was extremely unequal, lynching the brutal murders of often black men, but sometimes black women for not yielding to a white person on a sidewalk, asking for a receipt. You see what I'm saying? Looking at a white woman, they're gone. And the Tulsa race massacre where then influenced African-American community known as the Black Wall Street in 1921, terrorists killed and destroyed the entire area. Historians, historians now say that almost 300 people died, 97% of them Black. And we have the unearthing of white folks in the past leading double lives. So this is William Barton Rogers, the founder of MIT. He has often been uh, portrayed as an abolitionist, but lo and behold, Craig Wilder in his book, Ebony and Ivy found that Ro Dr. Rogers actually owned six enslaved black people 
when they lived in the Virginias, him and his wife in the 1980s and 1840s, excuse me, and 1850s. So optically, when uh, Rogers moved to the North, he became an abolitionist, but down South, he was a slaveholder, right? And this is kind of reminds me of this optical white allyship where white colleagues, you know, change their Facebook to Black Lives Matter, but are unwilling to give up or even interrogate their own power and privilege in their own positions. But Black Lives Matter, optically. And what I believe we are really fighting against is the university ethos. See, in spite of some really wonderful mission and vision statements, whoever wrote those statements should, wow, they look good. You know, they say all the right things. But the goal of institutions has never really been to be diverse. The goal is often to be elite. And how is elitism defined? White, male, heterosexual, middle class, able-bodied, slim, Christian or atheist, I could go on and on, right? So what we are really fighting against as people of color and people who want to see a better, more diverse, more inclusive system is the very DNA of many academic institutions. And I'm like wondering why would an institution why would a corporation shoot itself in the foot by not hiring diverse people, at least to make more profit? You know, more innovation means more money in your pocket, you know, means more accolades for you, means more patents for you. Why would somebody not do it? It doesn't really make sense. And my critical race theory background on interest conversion saying if white people's interests are served, they may do it. It wasn't resonating, you know, when it comes to STEM innovation, when it comes to looking at big tech. So I'm glad I read CAS by uh, Mrs. Wilkerson, because what she talks about is that, first of all, enslaved people were either penalized, punished, or had their innovation stolen. So you were punished for inventing something, or it was stolen by your uh, white slave master. But she explains something else. She explains that white supremacy trumps innovation. So what I mean is, if the powers that be had to choose between white supremacy and us flying in cars, particularly if black and brown bodies are involved in that design, white supremacy almost always wins. So one of the things, one of the reasons why innovation has been so stagnant in the last 50 years is directly tied to white supremacy. However, this wasn't the first time I've heard of this racialized hierarchy my dissertation advisor, Dr. Danny Martin, talked about um, and was really critiqued pretty heavily about his uh, the theory of a racialized hierarchy of perceived ability in STEM, who is perceived on top and who has the power, as well as an interrogation of the culture of STEM itself. You know, look to the left, look to the right, one of y'all won't be here. Like, as if that is a good thing to say, as if that is a positive thing that we can praise as a part of our culture. Um, as you see, Asians are on top, but I will argue later that Asians too are marginalized in STEM, but the marginalization looks differently than it looks from black and brown STEMers. Rochelle Gutierrez also warns us as STEMers that we really need to check our superiority complex and not seeing the value of a cultural psychology course 
and psychology is a STEM, but don't tell STEMers that, or that um, a humanities course, or a course on um, race and racism in America is not useful, is not valued towards their STEM products. So what we are doing is we are making STEM that all people can't use, and it's not equitable because we are not tapping into the knowledge and the information that these other non-STEM fields have that can really inform and create a more equitable and inclusive STEM. And for people of color, this message that, you know, we wanna be China, we wanna be the, be the super de duper power, that's not really resonating with black and brown folks who want to better their communities, you know, wanna stop racism through STEM, wanna make an impact on their society or the global society. And I, I was explicit in my doctoral studies about simply focusing on high achieving students of color. And I now really regret that because there is no talk that I do where at least a few folks of color tell me with very great emotion about changing their major out of STEM. And it was more about they love STEM, but STEM did not love them back. And now I'm pondering on, particularly when we talk about the pipeline, which is an insult to pipes everywhere, because if your pipes leak that much, your, your house would be flooded, right? But you know, I'm wondering how many of the thinkers, innovators, people who maybe have could have, you know, beat this COVID, beat the Rona, oh, excuse me, stop cancer, decrease global warming, found a way to go to the stars. How many of them have we lost? You know, why, why are we pushing talented folks, you know, particularly black and brown folks out of STEM? And what have we squandered as a result? So I wanted to kind of stay in my bubble of success and have all these glorious stories about black and brown people achieving. And I realized it's still very trouble. So you're achieving, but you're still doubted. You're still treated as an anomaly. And I've even heard black and brown folks who are successful in STEM being called freaks of nature, right? Like we can't reproduce this. Something is odd about you. Being stereotyped and being pushed out of STEM. So even when you look at these four brilliant STEMers, even when you look at the highest, one of the highest prizes they could receive in their field, you don't see them. They're not here. In over a hundred years, we have never had a black scientist win the Nobel Prize. And I'm asking not just people of color, but white people, why would you want to be in a field where the top of the top looks like this? You don't find anything wrong or odd about that? Do you not think that that is bad for science? bad for society, like Dr. Morgan exclaims, why are we okay with this? And I have got to do a little railing on black tech. I'm sorry, big tech. I wish it was black tech. Look at these numbers of black technology work workers. Look at these technology headlines. And I just got these headlines in the past six months. White as can be, little diversity, again, beautiful diversity statements, beautiful after George Floyd's murder statements. But they say they can't find us. We're hiding. We're all hiding from big tech, us black and brown folks. And some, for some reason, they just can't seem to find us. Hmm, well, big tech knows how to do things that they really need to do, 
Google achieved quantum supremacy. Facebook knew how to rig an election. Apple released all kinds of new products. But somehow, some way, they can't seem to hire nor retain Black tech workers and Black folks in management. So is it fit or is it because you continue to go to the top 33 institutions over and over again, looking for us, we're everywhere, particularly at HBCU. So in 2012, when I first entered the academy as a tenure track professor, I said, out of all of this that I've showed you, what is something that I can try to tackle in my career? And I settled on this because in 2012, 2.5% 2 of black engineering faculty were black. And in spite of some great NSF grants and you know, great motivation and, and what I hope you will consider great research on my part, here we are with the latest statistics in 2018 and the number of black engineering faculty is now at 2.4%. And in that time, we've hired over a thousand engineering professors in that time frame. Only 79 of them have been black. So we got a long way to go. I also want to say the majority disproportionately of hirees have been from Asian, Asian Americans. And people would often say, well, they're not being stereotyped. Wrong. So in my studies, I show that Black folks, students in STEM, are trying to prove the stereotypes about their intellectual inferiority wrong, while Asian students are trying to prove the stereotypes about their intellectual superiority right, right? So what happens is they're very opposite stereotypes and stereotype management, but one of the results is similar is that they're very stressed out. And stressed out seems like a non-technical term. So let me put it to you like this. They're having miscarriages. They're having fibroids at 21, 22. Their hair is falling out. They're being hospitalized for exhaustion. Before a test, they forget to eat, forget to get up, walk around. They have Bell's palsy where a side of their face is paralyzed. So when I say stress, I'm talking about dangers to their physical and mental well-being. However, Asian students are paid 30,000 sometimes more than their black counterparts. So the model minority stereotype has a material advantage. And you're probably saying 30,000, that's unbelievable. Where did you get that from? Some like critical race theory study? No, the National Science Foundation. You can look this up yourself. Where you see African-Americans in 2015 with a science and engineering PhD working full time, making 55,000 and their Asian counterparts are making 85. So I hope now we can dispel STEM being the American dream or the great financial equalizer for folks of color, because that myth should now be dispelled. That even on the highest levels, even with the PhD, the PhD does not save you from having financial equity in comparison with your white and Asian counterparts. Now, I spoke about this a little but I want to say that these STEM departments are creating some really serious outcomes for black and brown students and sometimes Asian students. I can't talk about all of the outcomes there in the book, but I just wanna talk about imposter syndrome because it's just a thorn in my side how 
imposter syndrome is managed. So we have our plethora of imposter syndrome workshops. If you haven't been in one, students is coming. And what do they see in these workshops? Well, they say a lot of things. They say, breathe, meditate, do your favorite yoga pose. But the biggest thing they say is syndrome means that something is wrong in your brain, that you're just a little crazy and that you need to change what you believe. So the biggest thing they say in imposter syndrome is we all have it. If you could just change your thinking, you will not have imposter syndrome anymore. That is the biggest way to rid yourself of feeling like you're an imposter. And I'm here to argue for black and brown students, there's nothing wrong with their brains. They actually aren't crazy and it's not in their heads. The culture of STEM departments is apparent and you cannot yoga your way out of a racist STEM department, a sexist STEM department, an intersectionality oppressive STEM department. You can't breathe your way out of that. And asking students to bear the responsibility of ridding themselves of a culture of imposterism is damn near criminal. So if the department breathes imposterism, why is it the student's job to fix themselves? Why doesn't the department fix their selves, right? Why don't we, re why are we continuing to recreate a system of oppression that we're asking students to fix themselves out of? And I don't wanna be a downer, I also want to say the students just don't succumb to their imposterism or succumb to a racially toxic hostile environment. They have some agency. They will two, there are two things that you will not see on this page. That is resilience and grit. Although every student just about said that they have to be resilient and gritty. Why don't I have this on this slide? Without dismantling the structures that create the necessity for unending levels of resilience and grit, what we're actually celebrating with these black and brown high achievers is an obligation to work themselves to death. Now at this point, oh, Ebony, you're being so dramatic. What I mean is we have black doctors, black lawyers, black judges, black engineers dying six to seven years earlier than their white counterparts. So these folks live in great neighborhoods. They have good access to healthy foods. They have some of the best health care, but working themselves and using internal functions like resilience and grit over and over again is a slow death. It is a premature death, but it is a death nonetheless. And I'm paying homage to Dr. Gilmore's definition of racism, which ends in premature death. So what we not need to do is ask students to only survive from their internal mechanisms because what we are doing is we are killing our students, our graduates very slowly. What asking for someone to be gritty without forms of external out of the body support is really just asking them to exist in another form of oppression. Okay, I got a hard switch. I also wanna talk about mentoring programs. So here's our mentoring program we have, and it's gonna fix all the problems in our STEM departments. No, mentoring is like, it's similar. You cannot fix a racially toxic and hostile environment with mentoring. 
Well, mentoring does a lot of things. And I have a nice big plus to show some of the things that mentoring does. But again, the focus is on fixing or assimilating the black and brown body to for and maintaining the white Eurocentric system. So many black and brown stemmers say that, you know, they feel very stigmatized. And the quote unquote diversity hires feel the same way, that they're really stigmatized through these titles and through this kind of diversity program. And the, sometimes the programming assumes that, you know, they don't have like basic skills, you know, that they're not brilliant, that they don't belong in that space. And in order to belong, you have to, you know, get rid of your red hair or your tattoos. Like what does red hair and tattoos have to do with you being brilliant in STEM? And why do you have to leave that out the door? So we often have this kind of assimilationist ideologies that's also like policing the black and brown body. You know, not just policing your mind, but you are policing their very bodies. And many uh, white advisors have this kind of, um, I'm going to say the, the black man or black woman or brown man or brown woman. And, uh, you know, it doesn't work like that. And, okay, so I have to have a black moment. There's also really caring, empathetic black faculty who say, you know, I had to do it. It was hard for me. I survived. I need you to survive. And students are saying, well, if you had to do it 25 years ago, and I have to do it 25 years later, then maybe the problem isn't our survival. It is being in a system that continues to, you know, oppress and dehumanize us. Maybe my survival skills is not the issue. Maybe we might need to change the system. But I'm pragmatic. So I do have a diversity program. I'm sorry, I do have a mentoring program. But my mentoring program is very race conscious. We don't espouse colorblind strategies where if you just work hard and you know keep your foot pedal to the metal, you can be successful. We talk about you know what it's like to be the only one in your department or possibly at a conference and how while you're trying to network with your white colleagues, they're running away from you because you're a big black man and how to manage that, you know? So we keep it real, but we also understand the importance of, you know, having a good research statement. We do that too, but we want to show, you know, a more realistic perspective of what being a faculty member may be. And we also show that for many faculty in STEM, that this is still the best job that you could ever have and they love it and they wouldn't go anywhere, but eyes gotta be wide open, right? Um, the book, I have a chapter that talks about equity ethic. So what this is, it, these are black and brown folks in STEM who not a, to have a desire to have their work impact their field, but also impact society and feeling as though they have a linked faith, like their own fate is affected by what happens to other marginalized members. So if their community ain't doing good, they not doing good. And they have a, a steadfast desire to make change. And I just wanna show you who, who embodies equity ethics. These uh, folks are pushing the boundaries of engineering. They're challenging the lack of LGBTQ plus environments and have long time, career long dedications towards increasing diversity in engineering. They're folks who are using spoken word and poetry to reach young people through STEM. There is a president of a historically black college who uses his nuclear engineering degree for environmental justice. And the sister who uses, she's a roboticist, one of the few black roboticists in the country. And she used robotics for physical therapy on your young children 
with cerebral palsy. So this is the equity ethic. This is what it looks like. And this is how it plays out in engineering. Staying on my faculty, I want to acknowledge that being a faculty member is hard. It is universally hard. It's a lot that we have to manage. Not going to argue with you there. But if you are black and brown faculty, you often have all of that. Plus, you are the educator, the expert on all things black, minority, diverse, race, ethnic, fill in the blank. Whether you have the knowledge to be or not, your black or brown skin makes you somehow an expert. Often, negative teaching evaluations. I got a teaching evaluation once that said she sipped water in between her sentence. Her clothes didn't look right. Black women get these kind of evaluations. Again, the policing of the black body and the brown body. Manu Platt on that first slide of equity ethic, the brother, he talked about it being such a long time where a white male graduate student would serve in his lab because they often overlooked him in spite of having a hell of extensive resume and grants up the wazoo because they didn't quite know if he was competent enough to advise them. And of course, we have the cultural taxation, the black and brown tax, where we are expected, voluntold, to be part of all things service, but particularly equity and inclusion related service. And it's completely non-valued at tenure and promotion. But it, they make it seem like really, really important at the time. Like it's hard to say no to the chancellor, but your tenure promotion committee don't even care, you know? So my last part of the presentation is what can we do about it? First of all, there are no cookie cutter solutions. There are no quick fixes. And I'm gonna tell you why. This is my white male STEM supremacy table. This is the foundation of many STEM departments, many STEM corporations. This is what it looks like. Now, if you say, well, what about those couple of black and Latinx folks I saw? Okay, great, here they are. Note, they're at the end of the table, they're periphery, not really at the table, but not really at the table, more like in the room, but not really at the table. So at this point, I would ask if this was live, well, what do, what do you think we can do about that? And of course, someone always says, got to break the table, which is correct. The table is foundational. It's not just the people at the table. It's the table itself. It's that history that I talked to you about. It's that slave ship. Like, you got to break that. So what does breaking the table represent? Often in many universities, it represents the diversity training, implicit bias workshop, hiring a chief diversity officer, professional development for hiring, and other pursuits that are worthy, but are not enough to dismantling the table. Why? Because after we do our diversity training, someone is gonna come up a few months later and super glue that table back together. And they might put some steel poles in the foundation. So no one next year can come back and try to break the table. Like the table is unbroken for years, boom. So what you need as a revolution at the table. So what does that mean? Don't get scared about the word revolution. What I'm trying to say is the entirety of STEM higher education needs to be dismantled, period. And then with people of color within and beyond STEM, those are our folks in humanities, folks that we think that don't matter. They matter, they need to be there too. Leading the effort, the whole STEM educational, and I would like to argue workforce needs to be redesigned with equitable 
and inclusive goals of celebrating racial diversity, not just tolerating it, but actually celebrating it, which will lead to more innovation in STEM. So it's good business sense as well. But we're not done. To sustain and memorialize our newfound diverse and inclusive foundation, we need the practices and policies to sustain and grow that foundation. Now, you might be saying at this point, well, what does STEM have to do with reparations? Well, after 400 years of not being a part of the STEM infrastructure, we will help you rebuild your institutions and your companies, but we need you to help us build and sustain our own STEM empires. And I always have to think about what that might look like because it's hard to work your way to inclusive spaces and places without seeing what that might be. So this is my sister, you know, building ships that will go, spaceships that will go to Mars. It is my, my dream of having the flying car company that is designed and created by people of color. And it's also finding cures for things that all Americans have ailments to. And it's, you know, racially affirming software. It's much, much more. But we really need to reimagine what would STEM look like if black and brown bodies were truly valued, you know, within the field. What would that look like? And a lot of people can't even imagine what that would look like because we've been so devalued. So yes, I know everybody's not ready for the revolution. So I have some do nows in the book, you know, if you're not ready, but ultimately they're gonna be the same piecemeal solutions without the dismantling of STEM. I'm nearing the end of my presentation. So I'll just say one, you know how historically black colleges, Hispanic serving institutions and tribal college take folks who historically white colleges won't and with less funding with less resources even sometimes with less faculty they infuse genius why why can't we do that like why can't predominantly white institutions take folks where they are and create help to invest in future STEM brilliance. Like, and why when we wanna know how we can do that, we don't look to HBCUs, HSIs or tribal colleges. Like what is wrong with us? They take students who would never make it into your institutions and turn them and now they're working for Ford and you know some of them are working for the Googles. Why can't we get our best practices from them? Why are we continuing to try to get our best practices from places and spaces that don't really, you know, mess with black students and STEM that much anyway, except to weed them out. We're looking at the wrong places for our models, for our designs. And I'm just not saying that because I'm a proud graduate of North Carolina a and State University. I'm saying it because it's true, it's true. Many of my cohort didn't know a lot, but we came out knowing even more than we needed to because our professors told us, you have to be twice as good to survive in the STEM workplace. What do I see for the future? I see a lot of fear, like real talk, people are getting their passports renewed, you know, folks trying to make an exodus plan. Um, certainly in the current political moment, they might be rethinking that. I'm also seeing a lot of entrepreneurship, folks who got laid off. And you know, black and brown folks have disproportionately been laid off of STEM jobs than their white counterparts. So not only are they paid less, they're first to be fired. And they're like reevaluating, why am I so dependent? upon this company. And if this company is making 70,000 off of me, how much could I be making off of myself? And there are a few folks like me who are getting ready for the revolution. 
So with that, I end my presentation. I have so many people to thank. I couldn't even fit everyone on here, but I'm certainly not an island. You know, it takes the, the great support of uh, my students and really the students, faculty, staffs, and administrator that I interviewed and followed through my studies couldn't have done it without them. I have two resources. My website has mentoring videos about how, what it is like to be a black academic and how to navigate and thrive through those places. And also in terms of methodology, how to do quantitative research without cutting the soul of black and brown bodies. You know, how to do it with fidelity, how to do it with the criticality of understanding how race and racism are operationalized. And with that, I'm going to stop, share, and engage in some Q&A. Thank you both, Nancy and Ebony, for your help in moderating the question Q&A. I know if we'd had more time, we could do some more of the questions. I did want to share a few resources that our planning committee for this professional development series has pulled together in support of um, how you might take some of what we've been talking about today and Ebony's book as a central theme of that back to your institutions and organizations. So we have some resources for facilitating anti-racist book clubs uh, in your workspaces and personal spaces. Um, I think the thing that I would like to highlight here and what we really are trying to do in our equity in action PD series as a whole is moving away from understanding to action. Like our first session talked about from equity to justice. So in what ways can you do a book club or a book circle that isn't just, yes, I check, checking off, I've read a book, I've learned a little bit more, but really doing some of the interrogation that Ebony talked about today on understanding who you are, where you're coming from, how we engage with students, how we engage with our colleagues in the work that we do, and then really working to dismantle and disrupt the oppressive barriers that are in place for our students of color and our colleagues of color in their areas that we work in. I posted these on our website, which um, we can share through the chat, but aspirealliance.org. And just a final, because I know we are at time, registration is now open for our inclusive teaching with Dr. Christian Castro from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and a few others from our planning team, which will be in January. That's open for registration. Our cap is at 120 for that particular course. And up on our website, there will be an evaluation because this is NSF grant funded and we are always interested in knowing what we have done well and what we could do better on and um, helping us in future uh, getting some of those grants. So please, when you see the link for our evaluation, we'd appreciate hearing what um, you have to say for us today. And again, just a huge thank you to everyone for coming out to listen to Ebony today and big claps to Ebony. Thank you so much in supporting Aspire and all of us in this work.